Thanks very many thanks for that. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the launch of this report, Housing for People with Dementia, Are We Ready? I'm Peter Aldous, MP for Waveney in Suffolk. I co-chair, along with, with Richard Best, the all-party group on housing and care for older people. At the heart of our APPG is the recognition of the vital interrelationship of housing and care. And I think this vital link has been reinforced over the past 11 months during the pandemic. And it does have a very special and meaningful resonance with those who live with dementia. The report that arises out of our inquiry shows how the challenges of living with dementia can be eased by attending to the housing circumstances of those with dementia. This in turn helps and supports formal and informal carers and family members. The report highlights and reinforces the importance of housing in providing care for a very specific and important group. The need for these two aspects of policy to be joined up and for departments to work together. Now, the report was written before the publication last week um, of the Health White Paper, which has as its cornerstone the integration of health and social care. Um, this integration must include housing. And whilst I think this is very much implicit in the White Paper, in the coming months, we need to ensure that it's made more explicit and is fully recognised as integrated care systems are put in place and rolled out right across the country. Special thanks are due to all those who've taken part in the inquiry as inquiry members, that's both parliamentarians and experts, and we shall be hearing from a number of those over the course of the next, over the next hour or so. I'm also, we're also very grateful to all those organisations who've sent in written evidence and who have attended our evidence sessions. I'll now hand over to Richard Best, who chaired the inquiry, who he will highlight the key points arising from the report, and we will then hear from other contr contributors to whom I extend special thanks and my appreciation. Thanks very much indeed. Richard, over to you. Peter, thank you very much. And, and, and Peter, thank you also for, for all your hard work as, as co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group. You're a real stalwart. You, you know, lots of wise input to all of our debates. Many thanks to you. I'll, I'll make a few other thank yous at the end, uh, but uh, my job really is to give an overview of this, uh, this new report. <coughs> we're, the, we're the APPG, the all-party parliamentary group, that... Uh, it works at the nexus, the joining together point of health and social care and housing. It's the three legs of the stool, which you were emphasizing there, Peter, uh, that are so important to us. Every couple of years, we do an inquiry into a specific topic. And this time it's those living with dementia and their housing requirements and needs. So this comes at the time of COVID. Uh, Dementia, like COVID, is age-related. The older you are, the worse it's likely to be. But unlike COVID, there is no vaccine for dementia. There is no cure for dementia. Uh, and this could have made for a very depressing report. But what we're saying is that if you get the housing right, the place where you're gonna be spending nearly all of your time in older age, if you get the housing right, despite your dementia, you may well be able to live uh, a fulfilling life. Uh, the, our report is not about care homes. Uh, we know what a wonderful job is being done in so many care homes, but what a struggle that has been, what tough times people have had, both as the care workers in those homes and as the residents. The right housing can prevent or postpone, at the very least, the need to move into a care home, into residential care. That saves the places in care homes that are so hard pressed. That saves those places for people for whom there really is no other solution. Uh, but housing can relieve that pressure and it can reduce costs, of course, the costs of hospitalization, the costs of, uh, of social care and it can sustain independence and quality of life 
we see housing as a real cornerstone uh, alongside health and social care in people's well-being in older age. Now, a few slides, if I may. Lois, uh, bring up uh, slide number one, if you would. This is uh, the evidence behind our report, uh, all, of the, all of the facts and figures. Let me just pull out one or two. 850,000 people who are currently living with dementia. 850,000, that's a lot, uh, but it's gonna double probably over the next uh, 20 years or so, perhaps a bit less, up to 1.6 million people uh, with dementia. That's one in 10 of us uh, who are over 65 by the year 2030. Uh, think of how old you are now and how old you're going to be after 2030. One in 10 people will face uh, living with dementia. In BAME groups, the older people, uh, 25,000 living with dementia at the moment, a, a, a very small number in, in the great total, but likely to double in just the next five years to some 50,000 members of the, of the BAME community who are older people. Uh, that's going to be a rapid increase as those communities grow older. And those of you who are involved in extra care schemes, a quarter of your residents are likely to be living with dementia. 23% see that figure over on the right hand side. So uh, the question for all of us is uh, housing for those with dementia, are we ready? Uh, and I'm going to suggest that we could do a lot more to get ready. Lois, bring up slide number two, if you would. So here are all the issues that we, we tackled. Uh, starting with joining up the health and well-being uh, sides of the of the equation, um, those the, Peter has very rightly drawn attention to the fact that uh, Matt Hancock uh, has been talking very forcibly about bringing together health and social care, but only as a passing mention for housing, and yet it's housing that makes such a big difference to the provision of health care and social care. Uh, second one there is information and advice. Well, just so important, not least for carers. What do you do when you get a diagnosis of dementia? You should be thinking, among other things, about the housing circumstances you face now and you're going to face in the future. Third one's housing supply there. We had another white paper. We had one on, on uh, social care and health from Matt Hancock last week, but we've had the white paper on planning uh, for a couple of months. And on planning issues, housing supply is so important. We need far more retirement housing for older people. We know that we do. Uh, and planning is part of that. Planners insisting on provision for this uh, age group uh, and indeed allocating sites for, uh, uh, in, to ensure housing supply for older people, but very, very little in the planning white paper. I'm not convinced that government is facing up to the, the size and scale of the issues here. Design our next one there, wonderful work by Sterling University and others. Um, we've, there's lots of good stuff in our report on design. I like page 32 if you get it to hand. Adaptations to existing property. We had brilliant stuff from Care and Repair England, from Sue Adams. 90% of people uh, living with dementia will live in their own ordinary homes in the community. And those homes may well need adaptations and, and some sorting out. Uh, are there the resources? Is there the advice and guidance? Is there the help? Are there the home improvement agencies ready to go? Uh, so much can be done with the existing accommodation. Housing and care management. Well, we, among other things we saw were the, were the Housing 21, the housing association called Housing 21, their fact sheets, absolutely brilliant, uh, running through a whole series of ways in which housing and care management can be uh, improved with dementia at the heart of, of the things that can, can be uh, sorted. Assisted technology. Well, for those with dementia, this can be a great blessing. There are some wonderful things in the, in the pipeline. From Alexa, we're getting used to her, uh, to geofencing, uh, helping people by so sounding an alarm if they stray too far from home. Uh, and we know we can know where everybody is with GPS watches. Um, Perhaps uh, a little later this morning, Jeremy will talk a little more about uh, the technological side of things. And the workforce, 
There's a picture there of the Guinness Trust uh, workforce, the dementia friends there at Guinness Trust. Uh, why not more housing associations, more providers of housing becoming dementia champions and their staff, their workforce becoming dementia friends. Great stuff. Other organizations like the Joseph Rowntree Foundation are into this. I commend the Guinness Trust too for their new scheme for the LGBT community. And they're not alone in, in, in looking to serve those needs. Stonewall, working with Manchester Council, but some special issues around dementia and the LGBT communities. Um, well worth dip, digging into the report on that one. Legislation and research, yes indeed. Lois, give me my, my final slide if you would. Well, over 40 recommendations. You'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to run through those, but <laughs> I hope I can whet your appetite to dig into the report a bit. The first thing is that we need a strategy. Uh, we suggest the Cabinet Office has a role to play, bringing together MHCLG, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, Department of Health and Social Care, Treasury, uh, bring them together. We talk about a minister for older people. We need somebody at the heart of government who's going to champion uh, the, the cause for older people's needs, housing included and very much dementia included. Then there's the, the, the funding that comes from the Department uh, for Health and Social Care, the cash funding as it's called. Uh, this this is uh, uh, this squares the circle because so much of the cost of getting things right for housing falls to the housing providers but so much of the savings falls to the health providers so if we can get dhsc to put up the cash for housing we get that transfer across that uh, that matches the realities on the ground uh, we need to, to boost supply more extra care housing more retirement housing more retirement housing 7,000 uh, uh, homes a year at the moment being, the being moment. provided. Oh, I'm getting a bit of feedback there. The feedback. Perhaps people could just Thank mute mute your, your, yourselves. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 7,000 7, homes a year at the moment is all we're doing in the private sector and, and the housing associations together. Only 7,000 uh, specifically uh, uh, accommodation for older people. And we know that we need something between 30 and 40,000. This is five times as much. Uh, homes England need the funding to support housing associations to step up their programs. And it's a very, very small part of the total at the moment despite the huge demographic changes that mean older people and their housing is so important and of course frees up housing for younger people. And here, I like this one very much, uh, uh, the dementia dwelling grants, uh, specifically using the DFG systems, the Disabled Facilities Grants systems, and Gloucestershire County Council with its uh, district councils is, is working on this. Uh, the admin systems are there in place but grants specifically to meet the needs of people who are living with dementia. Uh, lots of flexibility needed here. Everyone is different in terms of design, in terms of what is needed to their homes, what adaptations, what help and support they need. Everyone is different. And if there was a grant system that recognizes that uh, flexibility that's needed, and we can use the DFG system for that purpose, uh, so much could be done. Well, there's, there's 36 other uh, recommendations, including what we can do for ourselves. Uh, uh, let me let me go straight now to Wendy Mitchell because uh, no one knows better and no one has done more to to uh, teach us and uh, help us understand what we may be able to do for ourselves. Wendy, the author of How I Made My home dementia friendly and also the author of somebody I used to know a member a memoir uh, Wendy we're absolutely honored to have you back you've been a tremendous influence on this inquiry can I ask you to unmute yourself and and talk to us please thank you thank you uh, thank you thank you for asking me to say a few words at this launch um, as you said I spoke during the inquiry itself as I myself was diagnosed with dementia six years ago. I'd just like to add to what Lord Best said about the, the issue we face, the extent of the issue, as I was only 58. And dementia isn't age related. So many of my 
playmates, as I like to call them, are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond. So this problem with housing is, is an enormous problem for us to solve, but it must be solved somehow. With any inquiry, you have to involve the very people who are to benefit. Uh, the same goes for the design of services, architectural design, involving people from the start will save the unnecessary waste of money that so often happens because we're given, what we're given isn't what we actually need. When I was diagnosed, I was living happily alone in York and working full time in the NHS. Naively, I thought services and contact would kick in to help me and advise me both financially, emotionally. I had a mortgage. I lived alone, yet there was no help, nowhere I could go to. And I didn't know the challenges that lay ahead with regards to many situations, including housing. And after sinking into depression at feeling abandoned at the non-existent services, especially for someone of my age, I began to realize that the only person who was going to help me was me. I was forced into early retirement and in a catch-22 situation. I had to sell my house and move to a cheaper area where I could buy a house outright, as no one was going to give me a mortgage or allow me to keep my current one. I was forced to move from what I thought was my forever home in York to a quieter village in the East Riding of Yorkshire. You see, dementia isn't just about memory. So many of our other senses are affected as well. And one of the first of mine to be affected was my hearing. Loud noises physically hurt my ears. And audiologists are now starting to realize that many people with dementia have hyperacusis, something in common with children with autism simply means sensitivity to certain tones of noise. But they can do something about it by, by fitting us with ear guards, which filter out that specific tone. So my quieter village solution was the ideal solution. But me and my daughters didn't realize at the time that I wasn't capable of choosing an appropriate house. I'd always relished moving in the past and taken on projects and done all the work myself. And suddenly I chose a house simply because of the big picture window that looks out onto a paddock. Ignoring the two gardens to maintain, the steps up to the front door and back of the house, the three bedrooms I didn't need. But we are here, we are where we are and now I adapt it as Dementia throws more challenges at me. And when I did move, I hadn't appreciated how hard it would be to get used to a new house, to navigating my own home and a new village where I lived, navigating a new village. I live in a row of four identical houses, so I had to find a way immediately of making my house different. So uh, my solution was, because my mantra is there's always a way, was to put two forget-me-not tiles each side of the front door. And now I know that that house is my house. But I can fully appreciate how people can get confused and anxious when they move. Uh, even if they move into a care home, nothing familiar anymore, layout strange and things not as they were. I had a tiny kitchen when I moved in and it had two doors, which used to confuse me because I couldn't remember what was at the other side of the doors. My solution to that was simply to remove the doors to make it easier for me to see what was at each side. Doors are often a problem for people with dementia. Some prefer them closed because it makes them feel safe and others prefer them open. Everyone is different. 
I don't see the kitchen cupboards and the wardrobes because they blend into the, the walls. They're, they're, they're very similar in colour. So I forget there's stuff behind the doors. And when I first moved in, my daughters would ask me why I'm wearing the same clothes. But it was because I couldn't see the wardrobes to open them to find the clothes hanging all neatly inside. So my solution was to simply take a photograph of the contents of each cupboard and put them on the doors. And it's not the, I don't have to keep the, the contents in the same order as the photograph. It's simply the photograph that attracts my attention to say, open me, there's cups in here. Open me, there's clothes in here. Color and contrast is so important for people with dementia. And the easiest way to find out if any room, any dwelling is dementia appropriate is to take a black and white photograph. And if the contrasts in the shades are gray, white and black are, are marked, then you probably got it right. Technology now plays a huge part in my life, enabling me to remain living alone. I'd never used technology pre-dementia and my newfound friend is Alexa. She puts a light on upstairs for me before I climb the stairs so I don't fall over in the dark. She reminds me to do certain things all day long, even when I'm not here in the house, her messages pop up on my phone. And she can calm me on a bad day by playing me music and confirming the day of the week, reassuring me. And she even switches the kettle on for me now. I've always said that it's an advantage that I live alone. Sounds bizarre, but many people with dementia live alone and ha we have to enable them if that's their choice. And that's my choice because living alone means I have to find a way to overcome the problems that dementia throws at me to keep living alone. And it also means that there's no one around to keep moving things, otherwise they won't exist for me. But it's important for families to talk about the future and living, living accommodation, to consider the options available, the needs of wishes of the person with dementia themselves, but also the family. Affordability appears to be a huge issue when me and my daughters talk about the choices available. Ideally, I want to remain at home, but if that's not possible, I don't want my daughters to care for me. I want them to lead their life and simply to visit me as their daughters. But good quality care and accommodation shouldn't come with a huge price tag far out of the reach of the majority. If government grants were available to make adaptions to the home as Lord Best quoted, many could stay out of the care system and cost far less. But not all adaptions need to be expensive. Many of my solutions are simple, cheap and effective, but people need to know they exist. Something as simple as painting a coloured board around a light switch so I can see where the light switch is. It doesn't cost, it costs pennies. The findings look very comprehensive and I hope that the government and house builders listen and more importantly, act on the findings and suggestions. I'm pleased the, con the group consulted professionals, but more importantly, the very people who will benefit i.e. people living with dementia. To admit us is always a costly mistake. And the number of people diagnosed will only increase. And wherever we live, be it in our home or in care facilities, we have to have accommodation that meets our needs without the need for major reconstruction that will simply confuse. After all, if you get it right for people with dementia, you get it right for so many more others. Thank you. No, thank you, Wendy.
Fantastic. You're, you're such an inspiration to us. Can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Let's m move on, if we may. Um, and, and, and next up is Jane Ashcroft, who's Chief Executive of Anchor Hanover. Um, Jane, special thanks to you, not just for talking to us today, but for sponsoring uh, our inquiry. Thank, th thank you, Jane. Over to you. Thank you, Richard. Yes, we've been uh, delighted to sponsor this very important report. I have the toughest gig here following Richard Best and Wendy Mitchell to talk about dementia and housing, <clears throat> which is a, a bit of a tough ask. But I'd just like to briefly take a few minutes to talk about some of the key points that the inquiry has covered and the report uh, produced. And clearly, at this time, we, the value of good quality housing in addressing health inequalities is something that's been demonstrated very starkly. So I think we all appreciate the timeliness of the report, which the APPG um, undertook. And um, just by way of context, Anchor Hanover is a provider of housing to over 50,000 people between the ages of 55 and currently 110. I believe our oldest um, resident is about to turn 111. And our focus is on enabling healthy aging and quality of life across the country, operating in 85% of local authorities in England. The report is, is very clear, and as Richard has emphasised, the, the need for urgency in expanding good practice which exists in pockets to adopt a dementia-inclusive approach across all tenures and all areas is something that I'm sure all speakers will talk about. Some of the key points in the report which I would like to highlight, um, one of them is around the evidence that specialist housing re reduces the costs to the NHS and to the social care budget, as well as making a profound difference to people's lives. And yet we see a significant undersupply of units of retirement housing. We're doing our bit at Anchor Hanover, so our development programme is about 4,000 units over the next couple of years. But as we've heard, that's a drop in the ocean compared to the need for more housing. Richard talked about the numbers in the report where we, we acknowledge the need for between 30 and 40,000 new units. So there is a real need for significant progress to support the development of more specialist housing, but housing for all groups. Um, and we, we, I'm sure many people on this seminar um, are focused on housing supply. Also the importance of well-designed housing. Wendy's talked very compellingly about her personal experiences and the fact that well-designed housing is good for everybody. The example Wendy just gave us about hearing is a really good example, but we know as well that people living with sight loss benefit from many of the good design practice that's been developed for people living with dementia. The happy reports have been a really good example of the importance of well-designed housing for all. So while there isn't a single set of agreed dementia design principles for new homes, the good news is that many of the changes that make the biggest difference are some of the smallest, most inexpensive changes, exactly as Wendy's described. Lack of understanding though, by many professionals involved in the development process is definitely impeding the development of dementia ready housing. And one of the key themes of the report is about the sharing of information and good practice and both providing advice for those living with dementia, but also for the professionals involved in the process. And I think the recommendations are very compelling in this regard. And similarly, the technology which can assist people living with dementia in daily life is often the everyday mainstream. Wendy mentioned the A word, I can't mention mine because she'll wake up and start talking to me. But we've all seen the power of everyday technology in all of our lives and the difference that that can make to all of us. So there's no one big action. This report doesn't come up with one big suggestion or request. As Richard has said, there's no vaccine for dementia. But I think the fact we've made many recommendations for different stakeholders is something for which we shouldn't be at all apologetic. It exemplifies the fact that whatever our life stage, housing is the foundation of our lives. And it's inevitable that there's an interconnectedness in policy areas. So it's not surprising that we heard in the inquiry that every decision about care is a decision about housing. And that one of our key recommendations is about the development of an overarching, overarching strategy for housing and care for older people and the need for a senior post in government to oversee and understand the changing demography of our country. So getting housing right will, get, will make life better for everybody including those people living with dementia. And I, I think I can't really improve on Wendy's comments that there is always a way. I think what our report is trying to do is to enable us all to find our way in the most effective way possible. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Jane. Uh, 
straight on to Tom Redfern. Tom is from the Alzheimer's Society. We were very grateful to, to the Alzheimer's Society for their input to our inquiry. Tom, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think we'd all probably much prefer to sit and listen to Wendy for, for an hour. So just an apology that I'm taking Wendy's virtual stage here. Um, I'm here on behalf of Kate Lee, uh, who's Alzheimer's Society's Chief Executive. Unfortunately, Kate can't be here today. She's, she's taking a few well-deserved days off to spend uh, some of half term with her children. Uh, first of all, can I just say a huge congratulations to your best, Jeremy, Katie, and the team on pulling together this brilliant and really thorough report. I know it's no mean feat to do, uh, but the team have done a superb job at identifying the challenges, whilst also offering a suite of recommendations to mitigate those. As we know, there are currently 850,000 people in the UK with dementia, with that number set to grow to about 1.6 million by 2040. Within that headline figure, there are different levels of severity. Today, about 15% of that population have mild dementia, just over a quarter have moderate dementia, and the remainder have severe dementia. Due to the tragedies that we've seen in care homes over the last year, uh, where at least 70% of residents have some form of dementia, we've already seen increased reticence from people with dementia and their families to move into care homes when their needs increase. It's my belief that this reticence will continue and we'll see ever increasing numbers of people continuing to live at home, probably supported by domiciliary care or, or family care. Within health and social care, we're beginning to shift attitudes away from caring and sustaining towards enabling and thriving. We must begin to do the same in our housing and communities. The majority of people living with dementia don't live in care homes, but they live out in the community like Wendy. They're our neighbours. This means that we must both evolve our physical spaces, but also our attitudes. We must ensure that people with dementia are understood respected and supported so that they can live in a way that they want to. Across the country, there are hundreds of dementia-friendly communities and millions of dementia friends, all supported by Alzheimer's Society to do just that. These communities, working with local people affected by dementia, identify their own priorities and work with the relevant local partners, whether that be councils, emergency services, housing providers, or even local shops all to ensure that their communities are accessible as possible for people with dementia. Some of these communities might span large towns or cities, whereas others might just be a small village or neighbourhood. I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has, has demonstrated that the community spirit is alive and well across the country, and, and that people are not just ready, but eager to do what they can to do, what they can to do to help. I think that we must really uh, harness this appetite to affect real change. Thank you. Tom, thank you very much. And, and congratulations to all the things that the Dementia Society, the Alzheimer's Society is doing. Your dementia friendly work, you know, really making a difference, not least among housing providers. You're becoming incredibly importantly influential. Thank you. So, um, Moving on, Professor Dawn Brooker from the University of Worcester. Dawn, um, the links to health and well-being, please. Okay, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm having a bit of a nightmare uh, technology this morning. Um, thank you. It's a real privilege to be part of this APPG uh, and to speak today about the evidence of integration, the links to, to health and well-being. And as we've heard already, you know, health and well-being in dementia, we don't have a cure. We don't have uh, something that we can give people to, to stop dementia. Um, and even if we did tomorrow, you know, it's if we got a drug tomorrow, it would take another 20 years before we got dementia out of our communities in, in, in any way, shape or form. But in terms of health and well-being, As we've heard from Wendy, you know, we've got lots of evidence to improve people's health and well-being. And I know from the panelists, uh, uh, you know, the, the chat, 
if only we could bow how about dementia um, of our national knowledge, then that integration would be much easier. So we know about, we need to all understand the changes uh, that dementia can bring. We need to understand his brain function, and that's not just about memory. We need to recognize our changes that we can have to decrease agitation and distress. We learn about the emotional adjustment. Uh, if people can make good emotional adjustment, both the person living with dementia and the, 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 the family carer, then uh, by talking about what's going on for them, by normalizing and understanding, that helps that journey with dementia be a, a lot smoother. Being active and social, putting a, 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 to, bay, to bed the, the loneliness and isolation that really uh, makes dementia, the experience of dementia much worse and feeling empowered to get help and knowing where to go. One of the big changes over the last 10 years is that, you know, we have many more people living with dementia, but we're also diagnosed because if we're going to get a drug cure or we're going to prevent, we need to get people earlier on in their dementia. But most people now drive themselves to their memory assessment appointment, you know, so we also have that opportunity at that stage when decision making is not so impaired for people to have that conversation about the future. Because if you build in good adjustment early on, if you make those lifestyle changes early on, then later on in the, the, the disease process, you're going to see a lot less agitation, distress and a lot less cost. So that conversation about the future is crucial. And I think that's what we've been trying to work with in integration of health and social care. That health asks about care needs, uh, you, you know, and, and social workers understand health needs. The health. But we need to bring that conversation round to integrating that with housing. Dawn, sorry to interrupt you, but I think we're having a bit of problems. You make to your home to future proof it. Right. <laughs> Dawn, the Sorry. technology, technology Sorry, that's is me again. against you there, but absolutely. And we heard from a senior figure in the in the social care world that every uh, care decision is a housing decision. They go together, uh, totally need to be integrated as one. Uh, Thank you very much, Dawn, despite the, the technology. That was great. Um, and finally, amongst our speakers, uh, Jeremy Porteous, the, the, the man himself, who, who's done all the heavy lifting with this report uh, with his colleagues at the Housing Lynn. Jeremy, over to you. Just, I'll just unmute you. Thank you, Richard, and what a wonderful set of presentations uh, this morning. Um, I also must give full credit to my co-author, Katie Twyford, who's done a lion's share of the background research and work as well. Um, I'm just going to touch on some of the, the next steps and, and key actions that have already been highlighted. And one of the things that emerged very much is that, you know, we've got a large amount of digital inequality uh, in our society and again exposed by COVID. But we need to mainstream this and make sure that there's equal access to technology so that we can improve access to the information uh, as well as the guidance that's available both for people with lived experience, carers and professionals. 
we saw through the report a need to incorporate both the design and technology features in a new dementia ready set of principles so as part of the exercise that we've pulled together with panel members Damien Utton as well as people who have given witness give witness statements uh, from Lancy Nichols and Walker Simpson architects a new set of happy design principles that incorporate uh, dementia readiness and I shall touch on those uh, shortly uh, but equally as, uh, as as Peter Aldous kicked off uh, our inquiry launched this morning uh, that interdependency between housing and social care is critical um, and we need to think both the rethinking of the funding in terms of the capital funding that we've highlighted in the report but also the revenue to support that to ensure that we can deliver the affordable solutions uh, that, that Wendy called for. But we were also struck by the amount of uh, willingness and adoption of uh, the Dementia Friends initiative. And I think Tom mentioned that there were over a million people signed up. We felt that there's a need to build on that, both for frontline workers to be part of Dementia Friend initiative, but also to enable that there's more appropriate training and supervision, and indeed championing at the highest level in organisations, both at senior management team, but actually also on board boards so that there is a champion for the governance of delivering some of the leadership that's required to achieve both the cultural and the attitudinal change that, that Tom referred to. So what next? We sort of, I'm going to just pick up on a half a dozen or so things. One is about how we build on the influencing of the APPG's work, uh, both in terms of this inquiry, but over the last number of years around trying to inform and influence uh, how policies can be better adapted for, for ageing. And we felt here that we need to, in effect, dementia-proof those key design uh, challenges, the planning laws and consultations that Richard highlighted, as well as the integration agenda and to reframe some of that so that the issues reflect people with dementia, both in terms of looking at the assessment processes, in terms of making sure there's multidisciplinary work, but also ensuring that housing is captured, whether it's around a decision to stay at home for longer, or indeed a decision to move to another form of housing, which is dementia friendly. And critically, as I think, Richard, you picked up right at the outset, information advice uh, is at the heart of this. And we were very much struck by Life Story Network and Innovations in Dementia and others about the need to put the voice of older people and those with dementia right at the centre. So they're very much at the heart of the decision making processes. Again, something that's come up in, in the chat boxes. We also thought we wanted to signpost more effectively uh, to some really good practices out there, some of the things that Jane was touching on. Uh, the charters for dementia friendliness, uh, Tom talked about dementia friendly communities. I think we pointed out in the report that there are nearly 400 or just over 400 of those uh, across the country. And as, as, as Dawn highlighted, again, how do we ensure that some of the body of evidence uh, for making transformative change is out there? We encourage people to join appropriate networks, research community and working groups. Uh, and we list a number in Appendix 4 of the report where people can keep in touch and share both their experiences, but also the positive practices that are happening uh, on the ground. And lastly, in terms of the Housing Lens Zone work, we curate both a dedicated website uh, looking at innovations in housing and dementia, but also we've got a series of happy hours, our webinars coming up over the next couple of months, where we'll be looking both at new build housing, but also adapting our existing homes, both in terms of the roles of occupational therapy, um, care and repair, handy person services, as well as the main uh, issues around technology. And above all, this report highlights this is not about just specialist new bulk built housing. The majority of people living with dementia currently live in ordinary housing in what we in the housing sector we call general needs housing. And this report seeks to cover the whole spectrum of providing, providing a better choice for people uh, with dementia as they age. So my final slide is purely to signpost to both those people who haven't actually seen the report. It can be downloaded both on the Anchor website, but also on the APPG uh, website hosted by the Housing Lynn for this particular inquiry. And that's with you here. And if there are any questions, we also have a dedicated email address, dementia at housinglynn.org.uk. And uh, that's the advertorial over, Richard. Great. Well, no, important stuff. Thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. Uh, time for some questions from the floor. We've, 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 our Q&A box is, is filling up. 
feel free to, to send us a question. Um, and we, we might get answers also, not just from our, from our speakers, but from one or two others who, who have joined us. Sarah Pickup from the LGA has been an important member of our, our group, and Sarah's there. I think uh, Damien Utton may be on, the architect. Um, one or two parliamentarians are with us too, who, who may be able to chip in. I know Kay Andrews, who was a housing, a housing and old people's minister, uh, had to get up at five o'clock in the morning because she's been stuck far away thanks to COVID, uh, but she's with us too. So we may get other people joining in on the answers. Let's go to the questions. Um, start with Abdul Ravat. Uh, Abdul came before us with some wonderful evidence. He's at the Abbeyfield Society uh, looking at BAME communities and the issues affecting them. Um, he says the report correctly reiterates the links between the three legs of the stool, care, health and housing. When can we expect this to register with government and uh, along, bring along the, fu the funding and uh, the provision practically to break down these silos? When is government uh, going to recognise how important these links are? Any of my colleagues on the panel there like to just say a word about that one? Richard, Peter, can I? Peter, you're the can ideal you person. Would, just, just say a quick word. I, I think the, I think probably the short answer is that it probably has registered um, with government. And Richard and I did have a meeting with Chris Pincher, the housing minister. And I think when we mentioned these issues to him, it didn't, it wasn't as if it was coming as he was having a light bulb moment and it was something he had never been aware of. I think he was aware of it. The challenge is actually then bringing about change in government, turning around these great juggernauts of departments. And I think that, you know, that is where I think we're beginning to make a difference. I think the juggernaut of the um, and that, that Department of Health recognises the importance of social care. We now need to impress upon them the need to go that extra step. To, um, to embrace housing as well. I think I would also highlight the importance of not only approaching it on, an, on a top-down basis, but a bottoms-up basis. And as we've seen in the, in the chat box, there are loads of initiatives all around the country, Sheffield, Liverpool, Hindburn, Ashford, of great examples of what's being done. And if I talk to my ICS and say, what about this housing? I sense, yes, they'll take it on board. And we know there is an opportunity to influence there. Great, well, that's an optimistic uh, and helpful input. Thank you, Peter. A any of my colleagues want to add anything to, to Peter's remarks there? Um, could I add something, uh, Lord Best, um, Sarah yes, Pickup, the LGA? Um, just to say that in the, someone mentioned the new health and care white paper, um, yeah. and in there, there is not just about ICSs or integrated care systems, there's the health and care partnerships, which are absolutely vital here. Um, these are partnerships of equals between councils, health and other players, and, and councils of course have a role to play in housing, but the other players are potential, potentially in there too. They are to be locally developed, locally agreed, um, and a lot of the things that people are talking about, the small things, not the big things about can you incentivize house building, but the big thing, the, the, the things that matter every day, the, 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 the point about whether you're asked a question about your housing when you get your diagnosis, those sorts of things can be picked up through those partnerships. It is for local areas to make them work. And so um, seeking to influence that process will be really important. Well, that's really helpful to stress the local aspect to this. While we worry about central government, it's actually local government that is going to carry the, the burden here. Uh, I yeah. think we all, all also need to have some consistency because, you know, it's no point in living in one area and, and getting all the support you need and then down the road in another area having nothing. We have to have consistency. Yeah, absolutely right, Wendy. Okay, let me go to another question. We can be a little pressed for time. This is much more specific. Uh, Alexa clearly has huge potential to assist older people, whether living with dementia or not. 
but who protects the person from the data hungry owner Google described by one commentator as both the world's biggest advertising company in a quasi state with no effective oversight by any actual state. So are there other dangers of us getting a bit dependent on, on this? Wendy, you want to come in on this one? Is Just to say that I, I thought hard and really hard about whether to get Alexa um, because of all that. But I realized that because the advantages far outweighed the negatives, that it was a good choice to get. And I think the important thing about technology is we, we need help setting these things up. I was very lucky. I had innovations in dementia to help me because they are very complicated. So technology developers need to make things more accessibly work to be able to use it. Yeah, great. Well, you're a real user of the technology and you, you show what uh, positive results can flow from that. Colleagues, anyone else want to throw in a comment on the the use of technology? If not, can I go to another question? Um, sorry, to, um, sorry um, yeah, yeah, to emphasize Wendy's point, really, that the, um, there's mention in the chat box, people are talking about handy person services and the value of handy persons. Yeah. I think handy persons who can help with tech is one of those areas where, you know, for all of us, actually setting up new technology is something that is invaluable. And we know that digital inclusion is, has played a critical role during the period of the pandemic and is only going to be more important going forward. So I think like, as with so many of the things we've commented on in the report, we need to kind of mainstream some of these areas. Uh, Wendy described the support that she'd had with setting up her tech. I think there's a, a real issue. So about making sure that we can, uh, it's not just the provision of the hardware, where there's a lot of good focus and, and there's good initiatives going on to support the delivery of tablets to, to people, but it's also enabling people to use the technology. So I'd make a bit of a plea for a kind of handy persons of tech sort of approach, if I could. I think, think that's really interesting, a handy tech person. Yeah, we we all need we all need this person. Uh, that that's a that's a really positive idea, an extension of the handy person's idea. Yeah. So more questions. Uh, how important is social interaction and connection to reducing the risk of dementia? And how can housing do more to foster social connections between older people? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Colleagues. Happy to, to take a punt at that, uh, Lord Best. Um, the, the short answer is that it's huge. It's hugely important. Um, so ultimately, we don't really know what, what causes dementia or, or what prevents dementia, but what we do know some basics. And some of those are, uh, in terms of prevention, we know that we say what's good for the heart is good for the head. So regular exercise, eating well, all, all of the things that you would know about in terms of uh, keeping heart disease at bay, that will help in terms of uh, keeping dementia at bay, but it, it won't do it on its own. Um, but then also as well, once at, at the point at which you have dementia, doing those things is also really important to stave off the progression of dementia. We know that dementia is a progressive condition. It will unfortunately get worse over time. But by keeping uh, your skills sharp, particularly keeping your cognitive and communication skills sharp, is incredibly important, um, as you know, Wendy has very ably demonstrated, um, to, to stave off that uh, progression of dementia. And it's it's interesting that that Wendy made the point about her hearing, because we're 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 beginning to. Uh, to see that actually hearing can can have a really major impact on the progression of your dementia and, and hearing aids could potentially stave off the progression of dementia by quite a significant period of time. In terms of in terms of the housing element of it, that I think that's uh, probably fairly self-evident in, in what we've talked about today in, in, in cultivating that that sense of community. But I, I defer to colleagues uh, with more of a housing expertise on on that. 
Okay, let's try try and squeeze in yeah, one. Richard, could I just quickly come in because yeah, that's something yeah. that we were able through Damien and colleagues to look at both in terms of how the senses play a really important part of shaping one's identity in terms of the home, but also in your community. So we looked at things like access to natural light. We looked at hearing in relation to acoustic levels and how some of that is really important. Again, bear in mind what Wendy was saying earlier, uh, as well as things like smell about use of fragrances and the like. Uh, and Damien may have some other examples but we saw that very critically about trying to add to some of the examples of what a happy home could look like. Excellent. Deborah Broadley asks us, um, she says that her housing association is working toward becoming a more dementia friendly housing association, which, which is great. And she's not alone, her organization is not alone. And she asks, what are the top three tips to really focus our thinking? Uh, she's already a dementia friendly champion and 90% of, of, of the staff there are dementia friends, which is, which is great. But what are the top three tips that colleagues would, would give to a housing association wanting them to become more dementia friendly? Okay. Who wants to go first? Yeah. Top um, three? Is distill it to three but I mean I think that one of the main things is listening and the voice of people living with dementia being at the heart of what you do I think that is absolutely critical and I'm sure that the um that that's happening so that would certainly be my my bid for one of the top three would be listening and involving people with dementia in, in those conversations and understanding people's individual journeys and not trying to have a one-size-fits-all approach I know Wendy's trying to get in so I'll hand over to Wendy Wendy, please. I, uh, I was just going to say, don't assume we can't just because we have dementia. Enable us to think we can, because there's so many things we, we can still do. We just need people to support us to be able to do it. If I could just add a, a, a quick third, um, and, and um, I completely agree with all of those. I would also say that that people with dementia, depending on the severity of the dementia, can be classified as being disabled and therefore there is a legal obligation there to make reasonable adjustments as well. So it's not just about physical disability, but also cognitive. Um, so, so if you need a stick to go with your carrots, that's, that's one. Right. Well, now... Sadly, we are out of time, and I and I promised everyone that, that we would stop uh, when the hour was up. You've all got to busy lives to lead. Um, can I can I thank everyone? There's a lot of people to thank. Let me let me quickly thank everyone because it's been really a big team effort. Uh, of course, special thanks to Jeremy Porteous, to Katie Twyford, who's done so much of the work on this, to Lois Beach, uh, to Jerome Billiter, Margaret Edwards, uh, my own intern Maddie Harding, uh, all who of whom have put the report together with a lot of help from uh, James Floyd at Anchor, really useful, and Mario Ambrosi there as well. Jane, thank you for lending us those to, to help us. Big thanks to our speakers today, to Wendy, to Jane Ashcroft, to Tom Redfern, uh, to Dawn Brooker. Uh, many thanks to the APPG parliamentarians and the additional experts uh, who've joined in on this. Uh, I know Bruce Moore, from Housing 21 has been particularly helpful to us uh, and Bruce has been a great supporter of the APPG so special thanks to, to Housing 21 and to, and to Bruce. I think what so often happens at the end of these events is everyone has a bit of a look at the report. I hope you found it all right, incidentally. People were asking how to how to get to it. I think uh, the information on, on, on reaching it, either through the Housing Lynn or through Anchor, uh, Google them if you can't find the link. Um, the danger, of course, is that the report gathers dust on a shelf somewhere and people don't do anything with it. Well, fortunately, the Housing Lynn, uh, the Housing Learning and Information Network, will take this forward. They have the capacity to, to keep up the, the pressure, to, to ensure that everyone gets to hear the good things that we've been saying. So I, I feel confident that this doesn't just go out into a vacuum. Uh, the report will settle and there will be persistence in taking forward those messages. Uh, I just conclude by saying that government, we did have a good meeting with Chris Pincher. There's, there's, there's a willingness to listen but 
they really need to get their heads around the fact that there has been a huge demographic change and housing and care and health together uh, for older people really requires the emphasis, the coming together, the integration between them, but also the resources for the housing solutions that we've been talking about. Housing is so important to those other two dimensions to the lives of older people. And the Department of Health and Social Care will save money if it does invest, if government does invest in housing. Care providers need to keep thinking about the housing dimensions of the issues that, that, that their uh, particular people are facing. The housing providers need to think about the care considerations. All of us uh, need to think about our own futures and we just couldn't be more helped uh, than we have been by having Wendy as at the heart of uh, this inquiry and is speaking to us today. So special thanks to you, Wendy, for joining us and being such an inspiration. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, for joining. I think we had over 200 people on, on the call. So thank you all for coming. Uh, and I hope that this report will make some small but important difference uh, for those living with dementia in the future. Thank you all. Bye now.